<laughs> he gets us, which means a couple of things. He's touched with the feeling of our infirmity. He's gone through what we're going through and can be a sympathetic high priest. But that also means while he doesn't excuse our failures, he understands our struggles. And when you're in a rough spot, he gets it. He gets you. Jesus loved loud because he lived loud. He didn't live in a quiet, secret place to be discovered. His message was loud for the whole, whole world. And we talked last week that he loved louder than labels. And you should be glad for that. Thank you for that one amen. <laughs> I said you should be thankful that he loves beyond the labels. Because I can give you one and you can give me one and then we're all left out in the cold. But this morning I want you to consider from the video that Jesus loves louder than adults. He loves louder than adults. We think the older we get, the more we get it. And I'm becoming convinced at my young age, <laughs> that the older we get, the less we get it. I don't know what it is about you people. <laughs> but I have noticed that the older people get, the grouchier, grouchier they get. Have you noticed that? It's like when the color leaves your hair, your joy goes with it. <laughs> like what just happened here? My wife and I have made a commitment, a pact. We've entered into an agreement that we will not become old, bitter assemblies of God people. That might mean we have to quit being assemblies of God, but we're, <laughs> we're not going to be old, bitter Christians. Hello? Not going to be that. And occasionally, we have to remind each other of that. Because we have to love louder than adults love. Jesus calls us to be like little children. And I've pondered that. I came across an article that talked about the value or the benefits, maybe I should say, or the qualities that children have that adults tend to forget about. It's written by a man named Stephen Matson, who doesn't have any kids. No, I don't know that. I don't know that that's true. But he said some things that I thought were interesting that I just want to highlight, things that adults could celebrate. Do you know how kids are different than adults? They ask questions. Sometimes they are obnoxiously curious. They ask things that you wish they hadn't. They're not afraid of messy, difficult questions. But adults mistake spiritual maturity for certainty. And we lose our thirst for discovery. Children are honest. Nobody's more truthful than children, even brutally so. That's ugly. I don't like them. This meal is horrible. And we respond to that with a face that says, no, everything's okay. We're, we're experts at hiding how we really feel rather than dealing with it. Children are passionate and excited. They marvel at the magnificence, the mystery, the wonder of God. They scream, they yell, they dance. They gleefully cheer about God. They're utterly fascinated. If you want to see that, just come to a JBQ event. And I couldn't pay you to act like, well, some of you I could. But I couldn't pay you to act like they act like on the platform, dancing around and jumping around. They're just excited. It doesn't even have to be anything. But as we get older... We tend to lose our curiosity, our wonder, and fascination. Faith can slowly devolve into something that is mundane, boring, and normal. What else about children? They're gracious and forgiving. One day they're kicking, screaming, biting, hitting, calling names, and the next day they're best friends. I remember in junior high, I was mad at a guy, and I thought, you know, I'm going to have to start making a list because tomorrow I'm going to forget I'm mad at him. He'll be my friend again. And I didn't want him to be a friend. So I was going to write down, Brad, hate him. <laughs> I don't have to write lists anymore. <laughs> Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? They're trusting and loving. Children believe in people. They believe in God. They aren't cynical, burned out, cold of the world around them. But after we live life a while and we get routinely hurt, betrayed, and disappointed, we withdraw trust and love. 
and sometimes completely abandon it altogether. They're adventurous. Kids bravely do things nobody else would dare to attempt, and sometimes that's not very bright. They're experts at making nearly everything uh, breakable, dangerous, and hazardous. They jump, run, dive, roll, crawl, swim, fly, fail, boldly go where no one should go or have gone before. And adults are the opposite. We're logical, safe, calculated, boring. We turn Christianity into a religion of safety. Following Jesus was never meant to be safe and definitely never meant to be logical. So he ends the article this way. We mistakenly see their spiritual attributes as something to grow out of instead of into. We should treasure these childlike traits and seek to foster them into adulthood. God help us. So when I read the text where Jesus says, except you become like a little child, you'll in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. I wonder if that is what he's talking about. And I do think an application can be made. And I do think it's important for us to understand how they're different. But they're not always like that. Sometimes they're not fun. They're brats. Just volunteer for promised land. Sometimes they're rebellious and disobedient and stubborn and greedy and um, protective and territorial. How many know they can be all those things as well? So while I think the application is a good one, look at the values of children. The more I read these scriptures, the more I think Jesus is saying something else. I, I don't think that he's saying that we, should, that we should be like them in the sense of their attributes. I believe he's saying something else that even is more critical and more important. You see, these accounts of Jesus saying, except to become like a child, are recorded in all um, three of the four Gospels. It's recorded twice in Luke, once in Matthew and Mark. And I want us to explore those for a moment this morning and try to understand what was Jesus trying to say when he said, except to become like a little child, that we need to love louder than adults. Are you hearing me this morning? I don't want to be like an adult in some areas of my life. I want to be able to have that freshness, that 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 adventurous spirit. But is that what Jesus is saying? Maybe he's saying something else to us. And what he says in Matthew chapter 18 is that if you're going to become like a little child, you need to be converted. We need a conversion experience. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven, except you be converted and become like little children. The word converted there isn't a word that necessarily means salvation. You see, one of the things we've done as adults is we've put spiritual language to all, or definitions to all of biblical language, and we miss some of the beauty of the words, and then we make it into this. We think that converted means you responded, prayed a prayer, and asked Jesus into your life. That is not what the word converted means. The word converted means to have a change of mind to change your direction, to live in a different fashion. It refers to changing the way that we think. It's an emphatic word. Jesus turned to Peter. That word converted to turn. Jesus emphatically turned. It's the same word. You could say Jesus was converted. Jesus had a change of mind. Jesus turned 180 degrees and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. His relationship with Peter changed in that moment because of the things that Peter was saying. It implies a supernatural work of God's spirit. You can't keep walking the direction you're going and make it to heaven is what Jesus is saying. You're an adult and you're walking the wrong direction. You need to look at what's happening around you and you need a supernatural work of God if you're going to be like a child because you're not wired for that. I mean, we're superior to children, right? Well, we are, 
right? Are you going to put them in charge of your finances? You're going to let an eight-year-old drive your car? Who said, yeah, um, so I need a couple ushers alongside this guy over here. He's losing control. <laughs> there are all kinds of things. You don't want them necessarily cooking if they haven't been equipped. There are all kinds of things. You're stronger than they are, right? Come on, help me this morning. You're smarter than they are. You have more experience than they have. You know things they don't know. And you need to be there to protect them. So it's not like, let's start acting like juvenile, immature children. There's something happening here because our nature is, as we get older, we know more. (laughs) And can I give you a pet peeve of mine? Is anybody keeping a list? Because I give a few out every now and then. But it bugs me to no end when a child comes up to me and talks like an adult to correct me. Do you want to see tomorrow? I didn't say I would do anything. I'm talking about my emotional nature. How many know what I'm saying? So it's not the arrogance or the inexperience And you're not wired to become like them. So what Jesus is saying is, for you to enter the kingdom, there's much that you've experienced, much that you've learned, much that you've accessed that needs to change, and you can't do it on your own any more than you can expect a child who's five to make decisions like a 30-year-old. You can't expect a 30-year-old without the help of God to become like a child. It's a supernatural work. He's talking about something that should get our attention, that we should really think about. So what is it that we need to turn from? What's the context? What is it about little children that he's saying you need to become like? And what I'm going to do is change the conversation. I don't think he's saying you need to become like them. I think he's saying you need to become them. In your view of what's happening around you, how many are still with me? This really helped me this week. What is the conversation? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Their discussion is about position. It's about power. It's about greatness. It's about being above others and some being beneath them. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And don't tell me that you've never been in an environment that you've looked at someone and thought I'm better than they are or I can do better than they do or I'm more trained than they are or I'm more effective than they are. You cannot tell me you've never been in a situation that you didn't feel superior to somebody. So when you're looking around about who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven, he is saying you need to be converted and become like a child. So in other words, you need to see yourself not as the expert, but as the child. That you're the little one in the room that you're not the one with all the answers. It's not saying that you need to live out their, Jesus isn't saying you need to live out their character qualities. He's saying you have to stop looking for how you can be the greatest and see yourself as the little kid in the room. You know what happens when a little kid's in the room? If there's a five-year-old standing here and the fire alarm goes off, nobody's asking the five-year-old what we should do. Hello? If you don't know how you're going to pay your bills next week, you don't try to find a seven-year-old and say, counsel me. If your car breaks down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you can go through the list. So he's saying you need a conversion experience because it is the nature of an adult to think about greatness. And regardless of what a child thinks, you need to become like a child walking in the room. I'm not the great one. I'm the little one. How many want this to be over? I'm ready to be done with this message already. How we see ourselves, except to become like the little children. Are they the humble ones? No. How many know that children are always the greatest in their own minds? They believe they can 
jump tall buildings in a single bound. I have a grandson who regularly freezes me with his superpowers. I, I almost think he believes them. I do. I freeze. I don't want anything bad to happen after that. I'm, they believe they can fly. I don't know how many of you ever saw a child, or maybe you were that child, that your parents caught you on the garage roof with a cape, <laughs> thinking you could fly. An umbrella. Didn't work out so well, did it? <laughs> Mary Poppins off the, room, direct, off the roof, directly to the emergency room. <laughs> it's not saying to think like they think, because they don't think right. We see humor in their antics. They're the greatest ones in their own. I love the story about the little boy who was out in the yard trying to practice for baseball. I'm sure you've heard the story, but I love it. He throws the ball in the air and he swings and misses. He said to his sister, I'm the greatest hitter on my team. I'm the greatest baseball hitter ever. Throws the ball in the air, misses, throws the ball in the air, misses, throws the ball in the air, misses. His sister came, came out and said, I thought you said you were the greatest baseball hitter ever. He said, no, but I've discovered I am the greatest pitcher ever. And we want them to feel good about themselves. But Jesus isn't saying that. Otherwise, they're already there. They're already behaving in that fashion. Who's the greatest? And I can tell you that conversation wasn't, hey, uh, 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 who could I ask? Hey, Gary, come here. I want you to know I really think Barry's the greatest. And we're all talking about who's the greatest, who's the greatest, who's the That's not how the conversation is. <sighs> I'm certainly above average. Right? We don't have conversations very often about someone else being greater. We have conversations about how we're the greatest. And he's saying to them, not that you need to model their behavior or their juvenile immature ways, but you need a conversion experience that when you're in the room, if you're going to make it to heaven, you have to quit wondering if you're the greatest and start seeing yourself as the smallest. We puff up in pride. We want a hierarchy. We want to be on top. I mean, this will offend somebody, but I'm kind of in a mood. I don't care. <laughs> but I love the bumper sticker. And I don't want to offend you. I, this is just me, okay? I'm a meat eater. I have two smokers and a grill on my patio. And I love the bumper sticker that says, I didn't climb to the top of the food chain to eat vegetables. <laughs> I'm just saying, you can have it the other way, and I'm for you, and I'll affirm you. Um, and hope, anyway, uh, I will, I will. I'll affirm you in that. But do you see what we do with the hierarchy? I'm better, I'm smarter, I'm climbing to the top. I want to succeed. We talk about every human being wants to find significance. And how do we measure significance? We measure significance by people that are under us, people that we've surpassed, people that we've done better than. That we're not the average Joe. One person wrote about it this way. As a runner... And I use this illustration because I have nothing in my life that connects with this story. As a runner, I should be secure in your running ability and prowess and not feel the need to prove myself. But when people pass me, I know I can run faster than them. Something in my blood boils. I start speeding up in this weird assertion of dominance, hierarchy, even though I know better. Okay, that didn't relate very widely. But how many of you are on the interstate? Come on. You're driving the speed limit plus? And someone comes running up alongside you. Anybody else in the house want to hold your ground? <laughs> wow. Liars. <laughs> we all do. Stoplight. Especially this. Oh, this gets me. 
at a stoplight and you can see this sign. I'm in the left lane and it says right lane closed ahead. You are not beating me to where that becomes what. I'm just telling you. I'll put that gas pedal right through the floorboard, but you are not passing me. Anybody? Anybody? Come on. Come, come, come. Get back in line, loser. <laughs> because it is the natural, competitive, hierarchical way that we have developed that to a certain extent has been constructed by our desire to survive. And I will tell you there are times on the playground that you have to be superior in school settings if you're going to survive. But it teaches us something that's not healthy. And that is that we're the big man on campus. We're the important person in the room. Everybody should listen to us. Our opinions are right. Realize that proving yourself won't bring you much gratification from this article. Realize that proving yourself and being successful at it won't bring you much gratification and start to gradually recognize that the only person's validation you need is your own. And as a believer, you already have God's approval. See yourself as the child in the room. You're, now there are times, don't misunderstand me. There are times that um, you need an authority. Have you seen that commercial where someone's having a heart attack and this guy comes out because he's watched television and all the things they need. So listen, if someone is in medical need, I want someone that's qualified. And I don't want someone who's medically qualified to say, well, I'm just a child in the room. <laughs> Hello? But in relationship to others and their value, he's saying change the way you think. Because when you're demanding that others give you what you deserve, you're not headed for the kingdom. Because we're all recipients of grace. Second, oh, let's take it another step, should we? We must welcome a conversion experience. Because in Matthew 18, 5, it says this, whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Matthew 18, 5, Luke 9, 48. Then he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For whoever is least among you is the greatest. So let's, can, can, can I just continue to, dig a hole for myself that I'll never get out of? What do children remind you of? Scott, did I see you here today? I don't remember now which child it was, but I'm standing in the lobby. I'm ready for Sunday morning. I have my coat, shirt, tie. I'm good to go. I'm ready. I've thought about what I'm wearing. And I'm standing there, and I think it was a little, one of your little boys, wasn't it? So I'm standing there, and I'm holding a cup of coffee. And for no rational, logical, intelligent reason, he jumps backwards and hits my coffee. I jump backwards. Five people fall down. No, they didn't really. I, I jumped backwards and I said, Ron, you're going to have to clean this up because I thought, I'm not going to, if I stood up here with a big coffee stain on my shirt, you wouldn't hear a word I was saying. You would say, why was he so silly to spill coffee? What did he have for breakfast? Why didn't his wife give him a clean shirt? Do they not do laundry? There'd be all kinds of things you'd be trying to resolve in your mind with a coffee stain on my shirt. And I'm thinking I'm going to have to run home and change clothes and... I'm fine. And Ron cleans it up and I wash my hands and I saw Scott later and he said, I want to apologize for my child running into you. Now, wa watch for a minute. Just stay with me for a minute. Scott knows where I'm going, so he's okay. I've never had an adult do that. <laughs> We get that adult some help. Are you okay? What? 
global nuclear attack? What just happened? What? Do you know it's much more orderly and safe to walk through the foyer when the kids are on the playground? Hallelujah. <laughs> Anybody hearing me this morning? Yeah. yeah, no, they're not always fun. They're not always helpful. I'm not always excited to see them. <laughs> right? <laughs> I remember, I learned things as a, as a parent. And for those of you that are parents, and it's your first time around, write this down. We're pastoring our first church. I had a suit about this color. I mean, it was pinstripe, light blue. Um, it, was, it was cool. It was a great suit. And our firstborn is just little, runs down the aisle, daddy, daddy. And I grab him, dumb. And I pick him up. What's wrong? And then I found out. Don't pick up a sick child and hold them over your head. <laughs> Fortunately, it was after the service, not before. And I thought, take care of this kid. <laughs> because in a minute, I'm going to throw up. Hello? <laughs> I'm saying, no, they're not always fun. They're not always easy to interact with. They can be unpredictable. And sometimes they can be an inconvenience. I remember, as long as I'm doing this, I might as well dig deeper, but my oldest daughter, Crystal, was always still as a strong-willed person. She was a strong-willed child, and we were at a restaurant, and I couldn't talk sense to her. She was still wearing a diaper and, and out arguing me. So I took her by the hand and took her outside, and I gave her a little pop on the diaper and said, you need to stop it. And when I did, she snorted and got a bloody nose. And someone walked into their car, turned around and looked. They heard, whoop, would have seen blood. I turned her toward the building and said, if you make a sound, <laughs> you will regret this for the rest of your life. I promise you. I didn't punch her in the face. Sometimes they're hard to deal with. Is anyone hearing me this morning? Not always happy to see them. So Scott came to me later and he said, hey, I'm really sorry that happened. And I said, I mean this from my heart. I'll take coffee getting spilled on me a hundred times in a row to have kids in our lobby. But am I going to tell you it's always easy and fun? No. Sometimes it's a pain. We, we created this park spot for this playground, sorry, I don't know which it is. I don't want to get involved in this debate. This playground, and I told you the story, the, la the ladder, I don't know where it came from. No one's claiming it. And their kids, on the there's a playground for crying out loud. Use the slide. No, we have to get a ladder and go up on the roof. <laughs> so what does Jesus say? You need to welcome them. You need to welcome them. They need to be loved. They need to be cared for. They need to be nourished by us. So what is that except you welcome one? So he's saying, understand who they are and everything that's about them. So you need a conversion experience that you become like the child in the room. You're the small one, not the big one. How many are hearing me? And then you need to welcome that. You need to welcome that experience. We can do a lot of things because we have to. We can do a lot of things and still resent it. But you need to welcome that conversion experience. Do you want him to change your mind? Do you want, well, no, I don't because I have my rights. And nobody's going to walk on me. And if you don't do this, I'm going to do this. I've had people tell me that in ministry. Someone come to my office and say, if you don't do what I want, then I'm going to do this. We want to have control. We want to have authority. He's saying, wrong. You'll never have the conversion experience unless you're willing to welcome 
the conversion experience. Do you see it as something admirable? No, it's not saying that everything's going to be easy and that welcoming them is always going to be fun or that you will always be safe and you'll always win and it'll always be good when you have this change of mind. But if you want to be great in the kingdom, you have to become least and welcome that. In other words, you have to quit fighting for your position. You have to quit fighting. You have to welcome it. Welcome them. I can see it, but I don't want it. Oh, arrogant one. Do you welcome the change? Are you willing to let go of your position above and live with us lower life forms? Will you welcome it? Talk about living and loving louder than adults. You need a conversion experience. Then you need to welcome it. And third, here's where it really plays out. You need to walk in your conversion experience. Luke chapter 18, verse 17, and Mark chapter 10, verse 15. People were also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such of these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. What were the disciples doing? They were hindering children from coming to Jesus. They're not worthy. They're not old enough. They're not mature enough. All of these reasons, they'll inconvenience Jesus. And you all know that a child can take your time with no sense of social constructs around them. It's a legitimate expression of the problem. Any variety of reasons could have been used. But what's happening? Here's what happens when you're the adult. Adults say, we need, we need to let the important people get to Jesus. And these other people really don't matter. Push them to the side. I'm just going to tell you, if you haven't learned this, some people will only value you as long as you can contribute to their well-being. And adults think that way. Who brings value? Who is it that really needs to get to Jesus? And we create this hierarchy. And we say, well, this person needs to be first. This person needs to have access. But some of you need to stay out of the way. Don't you understand your place? Get in your place. Adults, put people in their place and tell you to stay there. And Jesus said, not in my kingdom. Not in my kingdom. You keep children, and I believe the application is if we're to become like children and welcome children, we need to walk in that and that there are people. Now, I'm, I'm not saying get rid of your boundaries. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying when we try to create a hierarchy who's, of who's more valuable to the kingdom and who's less valuable to the kingdom, we're thinking like adults. Oh, let me give you an example. I wish I had two and a half million dollars in the bank right now. So if you'd like to help us, I'll receive that after the service. There are changes we want to make to the building, to the front, and to the parking, and we've got these great plans. So let's suppose we're having a fundraising banquet. How many know if you're going to have a fundraising banquet, you need to have people there who have funds? Right? I mean, it just makes sense. So you have this banquet, and you got to be careful because you have a limited number of seats. And so we begin to measure by, well, these are people who have affluence and influence. We need to let them in. And no, you know, you're on a fixed income or you just lost your job or I, I really don't think this banquet's for you. Now, I understand the financial piece of that, but can you see how unhealthy that is? Because we can do the same thing in the kingdom. They're not worth my effort. They're not worth my time. They're not worth my energy. Well, they are if you're the little one. Because children don't see people that way. 
<laughs> Children will come to somebody who offers them a lemon drop that shows them a little bit of love and a little bit of compassion. We could go back to labels, but in many ways, we're guilty of eliminating others from our circle. And when we do that, we've not been converted. So you have to walk in that conversion experience. It's easy to say, I've had a change of mind. It's another thing to live out that change. It doesn't require, now listen to me so you don't misunderstand me. It doesn't require an elimination of boundaries. And I have boundaries for my life. If, and it's for your protection. If you want me to counsel you, it's better for you and for me if we don't do that after second service. Because I put everything on the mat. Well, if you cared, you'd talk to me now. I care for you. That's why I'm not going to talk to you now. Hello? And I care about my well-being. Yes, you need to have boundaries. You don't need to be accessible. I'm not talking about that. I'm not saying that we have an elimination of qualifications to serve. You need to have a clean background check and you need to be engaged in ministry here if you're going to be involved working with the kids. I'm not talking about eliminating that. Um, it does require that I see myself as an equal to everyone who wants to come to Jesus. It means that everyone is welcome. Doesn't mean we eliminate qualifications and boundaries. When I was in Bible college during the summers, I worked at a golf course, and this moment is burned into my memory. Um, you have the clubhouse, and I wasn't on the clubhouse side, I was on the maintenance side. So I wasn't a fancy clubhouse person, I was a lowly. Uh, a tractor operator mowing grass and out there all day long and there was a divide not intentionally but by the elite golfers you don't take time to talk to the low life on the tractor in fact some of the guys came out and they'd give a person a, a, a stroke off their score if they could hit my tractor <laughs> and there were areas where you could test out clubs there was a driving range there's a putting green there was an 18 hole course and then there were places that you couldn't so right outside the clubhouse was an area with nice grass and it was easy for people to come out of the clubhouse with a golf club drop a couple balls and hit them into the field out from the grass that was there around the clubhouse with signs everywhere that says no uh, no hitting of balls or trying out clubs in this area it was intended to be welcoming and um, I remember one day a man who was in his mind a big deal all that in a bag of chips came into the clubhouse and got a club. And he said, I'm going to hit a few out here. And the clubhouse pro didn't have the guts to tell him no. Well, I didn't work for him. I worked for the superintendent of the park. And he was a short guy, but a bodybuilder and a tough guy. And he comes walking up after this guy swings a couple times and leaves a couple divots. He walks up to him and says, can't you read? That sign says no swinging your club in this area. Can you not read? I mean, he, tact wasn't in his strong suit because he's dealing with us lowlifes. And he said, do you know who I am? And he was a prominent golf pro in town. Do you know who I am? And he said, I don't care who you are, but it's apparent you can't read. Take your club off this part of the course before I take it away from you. And I thought, what kind of arrogance thinks that rules don't apply to them? That thinks that who they are is more important than everything else? Adults. Adults. In some fashion or another, there's privileges I've paid for this. Do you, <laughs> do you know how long I've gone to this church? Do you know how much I've given? Do you know who I am? When you begin to elevate yourself to lower others and push people out of the way, 
you have no idea who you are in the kingdom. People who are really Christ followers want to make room for everybody. You have to have a conversion experience. You have to want that conversion experience. And then you need to walk in that. We're not called to see children as adults. We're not called to have adults act like children. He's simply saying you need to love louder than adults love. And when you're in the room, you need to see yourself as the little one. Well, how does he get us? Oh, oh, do you know who he was? Do you know who Jesus was? The eternal son of God. He was there when the world was formed. He was there when man was formed out of the dust of the earth. He was there and saw it all. The eternal glorious splend, splendous son of God. And what did he do? He became a child. Can you do that? He does get us. <laughs> when you feel full of yourself, he gets you. Because he's already modeled the way. And if we could just change our minds and love louder, that everyone has value, everyone matters to God, everyone cares, and that will only happen when you and I begin to see ourselves not as the adult in the room but as the child in the room now don't misunderstand me there are authority situations where you have to exercise the right of an adult but that doesn't affect how you see yourself in relationship to others I may need to set boundaries but I not need to not see myself as the valued adult dealing with valueless children the door needs to be opened to everybody hello needs to be opened to everybody Jesus loved loud he loved louder than labels and he loved louder than adults and I've been here long enough to know you have some work to do <laughs> because I know I have some work to do Hello? So would you stand with me? And would you pray this prayer in your own way? Jesus, I want to be converted. I want to welcome the conversion experience of seeing myself as the child in the room. And I want to be able to walk in that in a way that's honoring to you. Let's love, not like adults, but let's love louder than adults.